Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Parry Center in our continuing series, The Future Human, a conversation series, a monthly virtual encounter to reckon whence and whither humanity. Today, Michael Murphy will be in conversation with Dr. Alex Gomez Morin. This is the 12th and final conversation in our Future Human series. Michael Murphy is a co founder of the Eastland Institute and founder of the Eastland Center for Theory and Research. He is a key figure in the human potential movement and author of The Future of the Body, a massive historical and cross-cultural collection of documentation of various occurrences of extraordinary human functioning. Michael is an author of numerous books, including The Kingdom of Shiva's Irons, Golf in the Kingdom, Jacob Atabet, and An End to Ordinary History. His latest nonfiction work is An End to Ordinary History, Comments on a Philosophical Novel. Alex Gomez Morin is a Spanish physicist turned neuroscientist. His research spans from the origins of the Arab time to the neurobiology of action perception across species, from flies and worms to mice and humans. Since 2016, he has been head of the Behavior of Organisms Laboratory at the Institut de Neurociencias en Alejante where he is an associate professor of the Spanish Research Council. Combing computational biology and continental philosophy, his current research concentrates on consciousness in the real world. Following an hour-long, lively, and spontaneous dialogue between Alex and Michael, we will open the session to questions from our audience. I will now hand the discussion over to Alex. Thank you very much. Well, it will sound rhetorical, but it is really an honor, a pleasure, to be in conversation with this man, Michael Murphy, whom I have heard of, but it wasn't until Jeff Kripal, who actually kicked off this series, this current series, the Future Human Conversation Series. And he was the first of our guests until he spoke to me about Michael's legacy and work and vision um, during an in-person event in Paris. And I and I just wished, if only I could complete, culminate these years' conversations with Michael Murphy. And, and here we are. And thank you so much for accepting to be with us tonight, Michael. Well, it's a privilege, Alex. So thank you. <clears throat> okay, there's so much to talk about. Uh, I think the hour is going to fly. Um, I wanted to start by, by this. Right? Yeah. Your book, The Future of the Body. It's remarkable in many ways, but my first invitation for conversation, my first kind of question would be, well, this is about the future human, in a way, in the present, and also the limits of, of human ability and the human potential movement. But what is so relevant and surprising about this book of yours is that you place so much emphasis onto the physical, like in our sort of communities. We, we tend to go for the mental, consciousness, spirituality. And here you are yeah. talking about sports, the flesh. So, well, why is, why is it so important not to forget that we are embodied and that we have this ability to perhaps transcend our physical limits? Yeah, well, uh, first, a, a qualification. Body, um, as I... Uh, you know, you know, work my way through the whole idea that we are a body in this book is that you have to uh, you have to think about those phenomena that have been described in the great mystical and religious traditions as a subtle body, a soul body uh, in Neoplatonism, the Okima, you know, the chariot of the soul in Plato. Um, or in India, uh, prana, ki, chi, uh, and uh, just a, a quick little t tiny preface here, Alex. Um, right now, um, Eslan is undertaking, uh, a few of us at Eslan are undertaking a, um, a, a comprehensive uh, attempt to bring these many schemes uh, of esoteric anatomies into a comprehensive focus, and um, I hope you'll uh, uh, forgive me, but we're involved with a with a lot of the top people, or some well, some of the best 
um, in AE, artificial intelligence, uh, to do an outreach into these countless references in many traditions to the idea that the flesh that you and I see, that we all can see looking at one another now, is part of a more complex embodiment. And this comes out, uh, you know, um, uh, in all sorts of ways and in all sorts of uh, uh, means, venues, and so forth. That's what that big book, The Future of the Body, um, I'm sorry I had to make it so long. <laughs> but George Bernard Shaw said, if I'd had more time, I had to work on it, I could have made it a little shorter. But um, um, it does have about 3,000 references because we have made a long-term study at Esalen of the idea that all humans have a powerful impulse, often very, very hidden to them by their parents, by their teachers, by their priests, by their counselors. In other words, it's we are still waking up to a range of phenomena that point to where shamans and contemplatives and yogis and, and some of the great saints even um, in the West have pointed to. So the body uh, is partly the body we see uh, and largely the body we feel and, uh, and sometimes is the body that goes out beyond itself as when an athlete say, says about a performance, I played out of my mind. Uh, I was uh, not only beyond my body, but beyond my mind. We are self-transcending creatures, and this is part of the evolutionary unfoldment. And then let me just say, Alex, from the very start, I come at this from a philosophic position. I would have to call myself an evolutionary panentheist, you know, not merely a pantheist, and not merely a theist, but a panentheist, that the divine is present, not only in this world that we perceive with the ordinary senses, but in uh, the transcendent order. But um, variously named, of course, and um, variously disclosed in history, but um, this is the game of all games, this evolutionary drive. So that's where philosophically I, I'm coming from. But then, uh, <clears throat> so in that book, I, you know, 3000 references, there, it, it's, it's kind of shining forth here and there. But I would argue that when you look at the intellectual landscape of the world today, it's like a giant jigsaw puzzle pieces all here or there, but part of our task is to put these pieces together uh, in search of a comprehensive vision and uh, understanding. Um, so, my little well, preference is now finished. Well, no, w wonderful. L let's jump there and maybe come back to, to the flesh and embodiment, because what's also evident here and in the work that has been going on in Esalen for so many decades is, is this, this will to create an archive and a taxonomy of everything that is going on. And so I would like to hear about how was how does one do that synthesis plus this famous um, sentence I've heard about nobody capturing the flag. So how can we be open-minded, comprehensive, pluralistic, at the same time, one a third element, let me throw a third element there because you just mentioned evolutionary panentheism. So there are things we know, we, we know for sure, perhaps. There are other scattered things everywhere and then there are unknowns and then there are conflicts. So, so how does one do that? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, Alex, that's well said. Well, uh, it's a work in progress. You know, we are uh, part way towards something. 
But I, I, I really believe we have enough <clears throat> preliminary orientation to keep going. We're like uh, the world, the, the, the people who care the most and have the best clues to what's going on <clears throat> um, are like explorers who know, for example, like let's say in the days of Christopher Columbus, we'd heard that there was something if you went uh, in the wrong direction, if you went west, you know, across this Atlantic Ocean, you would get to a new world. But we didn't have any reliable reports yet. So although uh, people from Europe had, in fact, been there from, you know, from uh, the Norsemen, and now they're more and more finding out that so many blue blue-eyed uh, Native American Indians, you know, they had to have come from Europe. But in any case, in the days of Columbus, didn't know. So we are like that. We're setting out to explore something um, uh, as explorers do. We have enough sense of the right direction. But we, um, as uh, the various conquistadors come back, uh, they disagree about what's what. and. Uh, which direction exactly, and let's say who is entitled to go. And so it's been, Esalen's been going 62 years. I started Esalen with my friend Dick Price 62 years ago. I have seen more paradigm wars within within all of these explorers. Uh, you know, they're a feisty um, group, and a lot of them uh, are convinced they have the answers. And unfortunately, you find, and even sometimes they find they don't, but still they're in the right direction. So it's like that. So we have, um, uh, you know, had, well, uh, hundreds and hundreds of seminars at Esalen through the years. And so there's, I would argue, there's been a kind of filtration of um, uh, knowledge, I want to say. Things we can firmly say, but other things are open questions. Uh, and for example, this phenomenon uh, that we talk of uh, with the subtle bodies, or let's say in um, uh, prana in Sanskrit, you know, that kind of subtle energy, qi, qi in Japan, China. China. And then these pictures of our... Um, esoteric anatomy, you know, the kundalini, the chakras. All right, you get to China, and uh, there are in these, some of these ancient texts of this kind, there are no chakras, but there's a, da, a dantian, or there's um, meridians. <clears throat> so the maps uh, would be like the maps of early explorers <laughs> um, that... Uh, um, um, are you can see why they made that map, but it's far from exact, and you wouldn't want to rely on it too much. So we um, uh, have had uh, a challenge at Esalen to keep the conversation going, and with an embrace of fellowship, without um, without. Um, real war uh, among ourselves. Uh, and it's uh, easier uh, aspired for and talked about than done. Uh, people do crystallize around their ideas, and then these Dharma combats set up, you know, around this or that issue, and um, uh, even among uh, people who um, are interested in something they would call Kundalini, okay? a kind of a spontaneous uprush, uprush of energies from, well, the muladhara from the bottom chakra. But then you find uh, people who say, well, there are chakras below the muladhara in your legs. And that's a kind of a, a little known uh, as, uh, assertion uh, in Indian uh, experience. My teacher, Aurobindo, Sri Aurobindo, uh, talked about that. And we picked up on that in early Esalen because I was very interested in sport and um, the Native American running. And this is, see, now I'm 
I have to curb my own uh, um, tendency to digress, but um, well, let me let me just say because we we've talked about this before going live. It's perfectly fine. We're climbing a mountain, and I love when when we go winding up. So no hurry. This is not an interview. So let just let well, just follow you through your your path. We are enjoying it. Yes, I appreciate that a lot. I was, I'm a, well, in any case, um, as finally these questions have to be settled empirically, seriously, and in this, uh, our attempt has been to fully embrace science but not a science that's limited by f physicalism a science is william james you know his radical empiricism a broad empiricism an embrace of human experience i mean it's you can't leave whole parts of human experience out mm -hmm. uh, and that's why uh if you're too quick to your metaphysics to your ontology um, it's a premature, um, excuse me, but um, a premature ejaculation. It, it's just too soon. I mean, we have to let any, in, in anything, in, in physics, you know, theoretical physics, Niels Bohr versus Einstein. I mean, the greatest minds have had real arg lifelong arguments about this or that body of, um, well, of experience conceived broadly. We have to let the whole picture in. And this is part of the great work in progress right now, how to make sense of these divergencies. And um, in practice, as well as in um, uh, research, as well as in theory. So the marriage, at essence, we've embraced this marriage of theory, you know, with your metaphysics, your ontologies and so forth, research um including subjective report i'm telling you about an experience i've had and uh, you have to uh, either believe me or not so uh in the hard sciences and in, among many mainstream scientists today just leave subjective reports out well then you can't explore into these realms we're talking about that's what we've got and um, and we forget that mainstream science itself has always required some faith. You know, in the 17th century, when very few people had been to the Serengeti in Africa, and the first explorers came back and said, you know, there are horses down there with stripes and these animals with these extraordinarily long necks, and people hadn't seen these things. So they didn't believe, you know, the early... Um, <laughs> explorers there were not believed and some of the British uh, ones I read an article where there was, uh, you know this would be around 1610 something like this so these reports were coming from Africa and so these uh, British ones um, said well, you know the problem with that group that sent that report is that they're Irish they drink <laughs> all the time and they see things and then they embellish their stories you see as the uh, English prejudice against the Irish. And uh, so there, more of them had to go down. And this was before we had photographs. Um, but you see what I mean? It, but it's been true in domain after domain. Uh, there have been periods of faith. Uh, William James is great on this. But anyway, Esalen has been um, a challenge. I mean, it's always been um, a challenge to get people together in the same room who come from these different uh, backgrounds and stay in the room for say five days without walking out. You'd be surprised how many people have walked out of our, some of our meetings. It's uh, unbelievable, uh, and, you know. And so um, to stay in the room together and explore and the same thing with some of this research we're doing right now. Well, Esalen in that sense is, is really a miracle because well, I wasn't thinking about the time scale of five days. I was thinking, how do you keep this going like this this sustained effort for yeah. more than 60 years when you have these experts and also the experiences and you and you and they dance yeah. together without squashing one another so what do you think has worked so that this miracle called Esalen has has been going on and doing that for so long well i've i've been a very lucky guy i um uh started it i had the idea for it uh, way back um 
inspired in large part, not completely, in large part by uh, Sri Aurobindo, Aurobindo Ghos, the Indian philosopher, who has this very capacious, big view of evolution. And uh, now he, his viewpoint was not that different from the German idealists. Uh, you read Fichte and Schelling and Hegel again, and they had the seed of this idea that the divine, or the, or let's call it however you want to name it, or however you characterize it, has been in the game from the beginning. And that matter itself has a subjectivity, all right? And now you can take a modest ontological position of, and say a psychism or um, uh, a simple pan, uh, pantheism, um, but um, this requires also that you're open to a transcendent order beyond, um, but not necessarily theistic. It can be non-dual. I mean, we could be Buddhist, Hindu, or what, Vedantic, whatever. But so this universe, our existence, you and me, everybody, everybody has part of their being in this world, obviously. You couldn't hear us or see us. I mean, we're here, but there's something rooted also beyond what our ordinary senses perceive. And these are and the glimpses came originally from people that we would today maybe call shamans. And you know, the more they dig back into the Paleolithic, I mean, you know, these um uh, uh, this stuff going on in some of these dark caves. Uh, it, it, uh, I had a cousin. My mother's family is from the French Pyrenees. Uh, you know, um, not far from where you were. They were up there on the, the top of the Pyrenees, and they were Basque, actually Basque. So I'm fifty percent Basque. And uh, one of our cousins was the, was the head um, guide to Lascaux. You know, the great. And so he would take you down in there and. Yeah, uh, this is some time ago. Now it's all been shut down, and um, they have a, a kind of a, a made-up one. But then they find out there were caves twenty thousand, maybe thirty thousand years earlier. Uh, this is being pushed back and back. Uh, so the the shamanic uh, experiences, uh, and then so much has been found in you know around Lake Baikal in Russia. And some of these shamans are still out there in the forest. We've actually gotten to know a few people who who have been out there, and um, it's still alive. Uh, but it's it's Paleolithic. It's goes way way back. So the, the human race has been glimpsing this, uh, but with no enduring certitudes. It's been glimpses here and there. So here we are today in an era where science has given us an extraordinary certitude about certain zones. I mean, where we still don't know everything about the shape of space, the time and space, uh, and even general relativity now is actually being challenged a little bit, you know, about dark matter and dark energy and so forth. But it's... Uh, we have the certitudes of Newton. We have the certitudes of all the science that led up to Einstein. Then we break out, and my God, the human mind can find out things mathematically before they're discovered physically, empirically. Black holes. Einstein had never heard of a black hole when he wrote the, the general, you know, the, the field equations for uh, special relativity. He didn't even believe in the expanding universe at first. He called it his biggest mistake. He put in a fudge factor, you know, in the yeah. to get around it. But it turns out his theory was bigger than his his experience. So humans, we humans, outrun ourselves. We get out ahead of ourselves. Um, and some of our friends and relatives, even people, even people in our fa own family, have an experience way out ahead and get scolded and dragged back and. At least it's not like the Spanish Inquisition, you know, when you had, uh, you get burned at the stake, uh, you know, when you're out too far ahead. Um, so um, 
We are a self-transcending, exploratory human race, and we've been given up, well, we're being given countless intimations, countless glimpses, but what we need is more ability to bring everyone, not everyone, but enough people together. And I, I see Eslin very much analogous to where a mainstream science was maybe in the 17th century. And Francis Bacon wrote the, you know, Novum Organum, you know, the new Aristotle. I mean, to take it up to date. And uh, it was like he called the meeting to order across Europe. It's time now to put our stuff together. Well, they, I would say, science put together as long as you're um, kosher. You know, you have to be in, you know, the rules that are set up. Um, but uh, Eslin is not well behaved in that respect. It says, no, look, we're open to this other experience. But on the other hand, uh, we're not anymore like we were in a, our hippie phase in the yeah. 60s, where we were... Um, when Tim Leary was saying we all should be having LSD every Sunday. <clears throat> well, a lot of people tried it. It didn't work. It didn't work. Um, we should do this and do that. We were we came in naive, you know, but we endured. And fortunately, uh, my family owned the property there. So it's a little bit like party, you know. It's um where you <clears throat> it's good to own the land. And then you, if you're going to be a nonprofit organization. You got to have a board that is broad-minded enough and sensible enough, adventurous enough, courageous enough to do it. So you better be careful about your board of trustees if you're going to have an institution. So anyway, we've 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 learned, and um, so we're we've survived, and we're still going. Speaking about bodies and and Esalen as, as this place, and not just a space, but this place. I've I've read and I think it's I think it's here in this book by by Jeff right yeah. uh, that this that Eslin perhaps that's how you've called what happened what's happening there is 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 that there's a tantric transmission which is also very Aurobindian in a sense so there's there's a place for the descent to happen could you say more about it and also perhaps this is related to where we're we going you said well the divine has been in the game since the beginning well what's this game about and what are we doing human beings in what what's the, the 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 part the role we're playing in this game well you, you alex you know how to ask good questions i mean of course they're tough questions um <laughs> first about jeff's book um it's uh, in a, it's in a class by itself as uh, books written about us there have been other books but this one's by far the best and most comprehensive and he had an insight into it. Uh, Jeff Kripal, you know, for people listening, is a uh, real rising star. I mean, a star already in the field of religious studies. Um, and um, he um, has an enormous sweep of what he's engaged with. I mean, uh, and um, so uh, the, the insight, I feel, uh, one of the several insights, but he had in that book which needs to be brooded about more, I mean, discussed more, it was a good one, is that it was part, Essen was part of an inflection that was happening in the West in the mid 20th century from the Vedanta to the Tantra. Now, all right, what does that stand for? And what does that signify? It means that um, when you, uh, it, it, it means that when you become spiritual, you go upstairs, so to speak, to the transcendent. And you typically uh, have second thoughts about your embodiment. <laughs> God forbid your sexuality, because that's always going to get you into trouble. So it tends to be ascetic and so forth. Okay. Here's Esalen Institute now. <clears throat> we invented it. It was on this family property. It was my idea. And uh, there are lots of seminar centers in churches and so forth. But this one had a focus and all these celebrities were coming. 
And it began to look to a lot of critics. The, among its many sins was a kind of licentiousness, sensuality. Uh, and then these amazing uh, projections. I mean, people really lived out their fantasy lives about these great orgies at Esalen. And, and we did have these uh, hot springs. And uh, my grandfather had bought all this land down in Big Sur, hoping to build a spa on the model of the European spas he'd been to uh, Baden, you know, Vice Baden and um, the great spas and the hot springs and so forth. Okay. So, uh, but it was always a clothing option. It wasn't, it, it wasn't never a nudist colony. It was, all right, <laughs> newspapers. I caught up with Esalen. We had the first five or six years. Fortunately, we were under the radar of the media. So we, we an awful lot happened down there before the media started jumping around on top of us. But um, and uh, America has this running problem with a kind of Puritan vestige. And, you know, uh, and the tendency of even these tough guys to shriek when they see a somebody without any clothes on i mean it's so anyway it uh okay and then it got a critique that uh we were um uh and these are the uh, within the community of um uh explorers let's say academics and scientists and so forth come in and leading programs at esalen because you know a lot of celebrities there including uh, the further reaches of theoretical physicists. I mean, there were you know, Richard Feynman, you know, loved the place and uh, et cetera. And, you know, Nobel laureates were there and so forth. And here was Esalen, this bad place, giving everyone a bad name with all this nudity. Well, it's ridiculous. It, it was just ridiculous. And um, uh, then within the halls of Esalen, the same split started to occur um, between uh, the, call it the theists and the pantheists and the panentheists. <clears throat> um, but this was a bigger issue than just anything at Esalen. Now, what Jeff did, I think he deserves credit <coughs> for seeing this and naming it. Uh, now, it's not the reason uh, we started it, but it's certainly a aspect of it that's true. It was an embrace of our entire human nature, including the flesh itself. Um, that you, um, okay. Um, and this is where Aldous Huxley was very good. He was, he was an influence. Abraham Maslow are the early, um, people at Esalen all embrace this idea that everything we experience is psychophysical. Um, and meditation research, you know, I and a, my uh, pal, Steve Donovan, put together the first major bibliography of all the meditation research literature way back. And uh, the, there were uh, 3,000 studies by that time. This was back in the 70s. By now, there are well, many, I mean, beyond that, 10, 15,000 in top journals, studies of meditation. And uh, and we've discovered that uh, if you're going to change um, your consciousness, your body is going to change alongside it. They are married in humans uh, inescapably. I mean, you cannot escape it. And, 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 and furthermore, it started turning out that, uh, say, these studies of Buddhist mindfulness were, were producing effects that uh, were, had not been really known. For example, a group of dentists in Seattle, they, they did about 20 studies uh, measuring the saliva the saliva of, of meditators. Well, I personally, I, I still, I've never met someone who meditates to improve their saliva. I, I mean, I've never heard this. I heard of this. That's not why people meditate, but it happens. It happens. 
and many other things. Um, dozens of things happen in the flesh itself. All right. And if they don't happen, typically, the changes in consciousness don't happen either. Hmm. In other words, if you open up, you, you know, you open up in all the le levels of our being, and I'm we've got to say now, down to the quantum level. I mean, you know, quantum physics is in the game everywhere. Um, and there's some sorts of effects. We um that this this would be a dangerous digression right now if I started <laughs> Look, go, go go ahead, and if we go far away I'll, uh, with the room, well, I'll rescue well, you. And we'll... <laughs> well, we did get involved for about seven years with a really the cutting-edge group on, um, well, uh, those who are listening that know about quantum theory and the development, quantum entanglement, Bell's theorem, so forth. Uh, and it was actually triggered, I mean, by Einstein and a couple of his buddies, they were there in the Princeton Advanced Studies, and that, um, uh, you know, the, um, the the paradox, that if yeah. I, if, if quantum theory was true, see, Einstein really had an immense difference from Niels Bohr and the early guys in the quantum theory, although his, his Nobel Prize, it's interesting, Einstein's Nobel Prize, he should have had three at least, but uh, his one was... Uh, related to what we'd call quantum theory now. It's interesting. So he was in the game, but he didn't give it ultimacy in the way they did and et cetera. So, so at Esalen, um, we did this thing that started in 76 and it was centered, the first one centered around a guy named John Clauser, who, uh, who did the first um, um, experiment that had a direct bearing on all of this thing. And um, he he uh, he he did the experiment to show that Einstein was right that, she, that there couldn't be some sort of connection between <clears throat> uh, particles uh, far apart. Uh, Einstein was more of a realist, so there's no empirical evidence for this. But um, my God, he got the other result, and this is all via Bell's theorem. And anyway, so this went on for years at uh, Esalen. But I only say that to say that we at Esalen have been forced to embrace the physical down to its most, you know, down to the quantum level and uh, quantum computing now. I mean, this is quantum entanglement, it's a mystery. And all right, so, um, okay, meanwhile, the main stuff was into, directly into consciousness. You know, you'd have Buddhist teachers, uh, we had, Transpersonal psychology, uh, led by Maslow and company, um, and uh, studies of shamanism. But meanwhile, physics wouldn't go away. You couldn't keep it out of the game. Uh, okay. And so we were driven, I would say, by internal necessity of the quest itself into, and of course, the flesh. Because, uh, for example, um, here were all sorts of people now showing up at Esalen with a, something that looked like a Kundalini experience, except it didn't uh, it didn't conform to the Indian models. It was out of the box, but there's no doubt it was uh, an eruptive, spontaneous influx of energies that um, doctors didn't know what the hell was going on. And, um, and now you got to remember this is in the 60s and uh, there was, anyway, um, so Jeff, back to Jeff Kripal. In other words, we were driven not only by the philosophical background that I came into this with through, through Arabindo, who said the divinization of the flesh itself and that our evolution is forevermore a co-evolution of body and mind, or we would say body, mind, and soul, uh, and, and so forth. Well, and typically in the history of the great uh, transformative practices, this has been heretical. You know, it, it would peak, uh, the Catholic Church is amazing. It's the only organization in history 
that puts its saints on trial after they're dead. And, and the premise is they these saints are, are presumed to be guilty until proven innocent. Say in American, uh, in European law, you're, you're presumed to be innocent in, in a democratic society until proven guilty. Well, no, the church reverses it. <clears throat> so what do they get? What they get is a huge anthropology of their saints. And it's filled with, for example, stigmata. Um, not just stigmata, uh, uh, St. Francis triggered it largely. You know, that's way back, the 13th century. But, um, but also tokens of espousal where the nuns suddenly have a wedding ring. It's stig a stigmata. And then these other phenomena, and it's shot through with this. So, of course, one of the way, one of the reactions was, certainly in the Spanish Inquisition, um, that they're witches. And then they were, the, well, these are pagans so, who, or they're not nuns. They had a habit on, but they turned into witches. I mean, blah, blah, blah. We, we all know this history. In other words, you, it's the irrepressibility of the body's involvement in ecstasy. Now, now one, now again, another thing that confuses it is that many people in lovemaking have experiences that look a lot like the highest mystical experiences and never tell their lovers. They don't have any language for it. So, so when all you can say is, oh, I feel good, uh, doesn't do justice to it. I mean, it's something else. And there's a book out now, Transcendent Sex, by a psychologist, American Jenny Wade, who took the simple idea of after she gave a lecture, she was a mainstream psychologist, is um, say, if anybody ever had an experience outside the box making love, to just send me your case study. Well, she... Here's Masters and Johnson, you know, the American researchers in today's dollars spent tens of millions measuring every physical dynamic of lovemaking, but never asked people, well, what were you experiencing? So she did, and it's a book. And the book is filled with these experiences. You'd think it was William James's Varieties of Religious Experience. Yeah. Seriously. And all right. And then I, uh, in sports, I wrote a book that I, was a tall Irish tale. I mean, um, about uh, a shaman that I, someone named Michael Murphy was on his way to India. And um, uh, poor Murphy, he ran into this shaman and uh, <laughs> immediately left. But anyway, so it was a book and it opened the door. So for it was published 52 years ago. I've been hearing from athletes now, Alex, for 50 years. And if I put together a... Um, Compendium. I've I've written other books about this happening all the time, hiding in plain sight. People love sports. You know, we go to the Olympic Games, we go to the World Cup, we 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 uh, in America. You know, the basketball and the baseball and the football. And meanwhile, all these experiences are happening. I I have written a couple of books on this, and um, it's astonishing how a culture can screen out a realm of experience. We humans have a genius for selective memory and repression. Father Freud was right. I mean, he, uh, except he, he himself screened out a lot, although he <laughs> was more open to the occult and the mystical that he's generally given credit for. I mean, he, he finally came out in public, you know, and articles published and to the shock of some of his followers in psychoanalytic studies, that telepathy is a fact. He said telepathy is a fact. And his biographer, you know, um, Jones said, uh, Freud, you cannot publish this. You're going to ruin our, our reputation. And he said, I'm going to follow the experiment of my life to describe the what's happening, no matter what the consequences. And of course, he was a historic figure in that regard. But he, but then, then Jung, and then now transpersonal psychology now is wide open uh, intellectually. <clears throat> but uh, again, um, we don't fully 
yet understand the miracles of this human body we have uh, and our own embodiment. We have glimpses. And a lot of us know a, a, a lot more. I mean, the, you know, it's um, anyway. Well, what, so, a, what a gentle, what a gentle net, right? As you as you're, as you're describing this, it comes to mind this image of a net of a spider web, but like it's flexible but strong, and you're just picking up all this true phenomenology of what it is yeah. to be human, and also integrating it around yes. the, the structure. Yes, and that's you know there are two sides to Esalen. Uh, one is a public the public programmings, and about. <clears throat> Well, hundreds of people come there every year from all over the world, by the way. Um, uh, we have a very uh, a worldwide audience. and um, But the other side is what we call our Center for Theory and Research. It's, but it's uh, not open to the public, and it's that way. It would be like a, a, a university in Europe or America where you have... Um, a research side and then an undergraduate side. So you, the uh, undergraduates are there to learn to be cultivated people and, and hopefully some liberal sensibilities and literature and philosophy and music and philosophy and so forth. But a graduate school to pursue um, in a safe place, a tenured professors, the further reaches of human knowing from uh, now religious studies uh, in its present form, only really appeared in, a, well, certainly in America, and it was triggered by a number of Europeans who had come to America at the University of Chicago, um, like Mircea Eliade and others. But it's wide open now, religious studies, to all these rogue phenomena, anomalous phenomena, um, disreputable phenomena. Uh, and so undergraduates are learning that. But at the same time, um, um, a kind of a golden lid uh, because the professors and the parents of the students don't want their students, quote, misbehaving. And uh, the dean of men at Stanford, when I flipped out, I was just an undergraduate and uh, excited by this guy from Europe, Frederick Spiegelberg, the great, great uh, 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 dean friend of Paul Tillich's and he um anyway uh, fortunately he he got out of uh, Germany in, in 37 or 38 he came close to being trapped there but he um uh anyway so I and a few of us um well I gave up what my family hoped and expected from me and um um, but I stayed in school. So the Dean of Men at one point told me, he said, you know, Michael, um, um, there are a lot of people here who want to get rid of your Spiegelberg. And I said to him, I said, well, why? He's a stupendous lecturer and scholar. He said, you know why? We, we want our students here to know about these things and be cultivated but not excited like you are. <laughs> I mean, it was, it, it, he really nailed it. I mean, it's true. And uh, so there's a lot of, and Jeff Kripal, his, his big new book called The Superhumanities is a call to open up the halls of academia uh, generally to these so-called rogue phenomena and to bring all these good minds to bear. Now, that's what we're trying to do with this project with AI and et cetera on subtle bodies. But we've been doing this one way or another. And we've had, you know, a tiny little institute out there on the edge of the cliff in California there, yeah. um, barely civilized. And um, we, um, uh, so, but with gathering more wherewithal, more um, um, means, more talent, more money to go after some of the and it's it's low hanging fruit mm. for for a professor uh if he wants a uh, a thesis for one of his graduate students boy have we got ideas yes. i mean so much uh, that's just we are in our field i feel 
very much like the early 17th century when Francis Bacon wrote the Novum Organum. We're kind mm -hmm. of like that. You know, Newton was alive already and Galileo and Copernicus had been there. But, but here was all this stuff and um, we got to get our act together and go after it <clears throat> instead of spending money. Well, anyway. Let me let me ask you. I have a, at least two or three things I'd like to throw at you, and they're they're not easy either. Because one is about you spoke about these celebrities, these great, great, famous um, academics and and explorers that have gone and and lived through, gone through the worlds of Esalen, and so what they did for Esalen and what Esalen did for them, um, and also. I'm realizing that the world is full of lone wolves. If you if you if you see what I mean by uh -huh. this analogy, that the the world is full of these lone wolves, like people who are really deep into their game. But it's I find a challenge to put them together. So there's yeah. a question about how do you do it to have them together and and really form a pack, despite that they're in the, it's in their own nature to be lonely and and deep, and also how that when you put them together transforms Esalen, but in turn transform them who then go back to their places. And, you know, Esalen goes beyond Esalen, in a sense. Those are those are great questions, Alex. Those are very important. Um, <clears throat> well, there are different ways you keep people together. Um, one uh, guy, he was really as tops in, um, you would call it the uh, psychosociology uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, a studying of animals and he was um the uh, stanford university has a big um um primate uh, uh, farm up there and he was world class and you would changing the social configurations and then measuring the changes physically you know hormonally and so forth all right and he, so we were putting scientists together with our body workers and our body workers um the few of them have any phds and the language is um uh, the kind of pigeon languages you know there's a cluster of science who's into this even in physics the pigeon languages these are the crude and um so what some of these body workers have they don't have a word for an experience so instead they'll use a sound like oh a, a kind of groaning of pleasure let's say like this and that would be how you talk to one another. So finally, this professor, he, he was really into this and looking at it from the point of view, his chimpanzees. And, and so one morning I come downstairs and he's leaving with a suitcase on a Tuesday of a conference. And I said, come back in here. What, what's, what's wrong? He says, I can't take this anymore. These people, they don't speak, they grunt, they sigh, and they don't think either. They just do the things. I said, now, wait a minute. Come on. You've put all this time in it. You stay here. God damn it. And uh, <laughs> he stayed. At lunchtime that day, he left again. So I had literally pulled him back in. Now we had a bunch of friends. And he had particularly bonded with one of these body workers. But she spoke her own language, really. She had made it up to go for all these changes she was causing. Um, to make a long story short, they ended up doing seminars together all over the world. Gig Levine, he was this professor leading uh, world reputation, and uh, Bonnie Brembridge, a Cohen, who um, uh, was a sh shamaness, uh, you know. All right. Yeah. As part of it is just our persuasion and sometimes brute force pulling someone back in the room. Okay. But <laughs> the other way, it happens is that, um, and this <laughs> started in the early 60s, it's, it's like uh, somebody who's got real standing. All right, but he's married and he, it's, it's as if he goes off to be with a mistress and uh, doesn't uh, tell anyone, but he's, so he's in love, but it, he's living a double life. So this started to happen. So you come, and but you don't tell anyone. You keep it a secret, seriously. And this happened. So that was a, a class of uh, people. And then, um, 
So these, this is, I, I'm looking here now at the sociology of this whole enterprise. Okay, then another thing is that um, people are um, natural deal makers. So, uh, you know, I can sit out on the deck at Essen and hear people making intellectual deals. What now? And I, I remember once um, I knew this guy was a physicist listening to another group that I also knew were physicists. And I could hear them both. Uh, I, I really didn't need to hear this one guy was sitting alone. So anyway, this thing ended and now they're going and I go up to the one guy sitting alone. I said, um, you, you were listening in with them. And he said, yes. And they showed me I've, I'm a failure. I've gone down the wrong path. I listened, to, I took notes. They disproved my theory. It's a true story. So this kind of stuff is going on down there. I would call it just um, natural networking, trading secrets. A lot of mm -hmm. academics um, want to keep their things secrets. I, I, I would say the harder the science, the more it is physics, the more uh, you want to keep those secrets because, and, but and then you get up in, in psychology too. Uh, they're they're generally more porous, but networking. So it's incalculable how many connections have been made spontaneously down there just by having people, you know, and having a glass of wine together, maybe, uh, or uh, going to the hot baths, or it's after the hours, or just hanging out. Uh, in different groups, um, networking. So it's been a feast of networking, invisibly. And then finally, there are the brave souls, you know, who are out there and uh, have the courage of just tell people and um, say someone like Roger uh, 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 Feynman, Rob Feynman. I mean, he was, you know, I mean, my God, he's a top of top of the of the world there, and. Um, he was completely out front about everything. And the same with Maslow, Aldous Huxley. Uh, so an awful lot of intellectual celebrities were coming and were brave and open. But an awful lot went on under the table, so to speak. L and let I me ask you, because like, I knew this would happen. I would talk to you forever. Let me ask you two more things. <laughs> Let's see, because we should. I should I should start wrapping up and, and then allowing our... our you know, or people to also ask questions. But since we spoke about the, the sociology of it, I'm also intrigued by the politics and the fact that Eslin also being at the edge, physically yeah. at the edge and at the edge of all of that, you also got involved in politics. Right. Why? Yeah. What, what a responsibility. Because well, that's that's yeah. already too much. It's already too much what's going on. And on top of it, you go for yeah. that. Well, okay, uh, the way it happened, uh, our biggest involvement, I mean, first of all, a lot of it was out of, um, we felt we had something to offer immediately. We had black, white encounter groups, uh, and, you know, encounter groups telling truths, but exploring particularly unconscious racism. And that started in the uh, mid 60s. So they were very early. Uh, and a, a black psychiatrist, Price Cobbs, and George Leonard. My dear and deep friend, who was the West Coast editor of Look Magazine, they started these. And it came naturally to us, okay, directly as a cause. And it morphed. It went on for about three years, these groups. And they were amazing groups of folks, here, black and white, together in these hot tubs when it was against the law to be in the same swimming pool still in the late 60s and in many southern states. All right. So that would come naturally out of our calling. But the biggest involvement of all came serendipitously with Russia, because we started hearing that in Russia, they were pursuing the same things we were calling human potentials, hidden human reserves. So I went over there in 1971, met a lot of these crazy and wild folks <laughs> doing the damnedest experiments. And it grew and grew and grew. And along the way, we got to be friends with people in the Central Committee and a few in the Politburo who were doing these experiences with healers and 
at parapsychology, and <clears throat> we actually conducted an experiment between Moscow and San Francisco and telepathy with his famous telepathist. And he, he got the stuff. I was the center. I mean, it was unbelievable. And it's all right. And then came the, um, um, well, the awakening within the central committee and Politburo that communism was not working. And uh, people don't realize it, it It was coming away before Gorbachev. It was, uh, and the, the whole, and so they were telling us, because in these programs at Esson, we're honest with each other. So we were finding out, so pretty soon, we had KGB and CIA guys together down there. They knew. They were telling each other stuff. So we got involved in this um, inadvertently, really. It was just because you open up and, you know, all right. Now, we've had the tragedy of this relapse into Putin and into this the horror of this war and the return to this authoritarian spirit. So it's been probably um, in my life and activities, my biggest disappointment to see this awful turnaround, you know, and it's... Um, and it's right up there with what's going on now in Israel with Ham Hamas and all of that, because um, we've had, um, you know, so many people from Israel come to Esalen, and so many of the leaders have been Jewish. So we, uh, you know, our heart is with them there. So in other words, the place um, has been led by events into the political. Now, we could, uh, then we say, well, People will say, well, why do you have to do it? Well, I was doing our, yes, uh, following yes. our, uh, what I would say, the urge to help out. Um, <clears throat> although it was not our main intention in the beginning. But uh, the, the final, I would say, if I wanted to get very philosophical about it, is that you can't separate humans into separate parts. I mean, we're all political. Every family has its politics, and um, and there's been quite a huge literature on this. And um, it's um, so sociology morphs to politics morphs. Yes, yes. Et cetera. You you're you're enacting as just explaining these the very theme we're we're trying to explicate here. Yes, the, these these interrelatedness. Final one. <laughs> In ending, I want to talk about death. Because, and we, we, we cannot end without at least mentioning this, because at the Center for Theory and Research, you had several right. lines, and one of them was survival. And, well, it's, right. it's so important, not just academically, but, well, we're oh. all going to die. So what's going to happen? What, right. what, what survives, if anything? Right. All right. Well, for 13 years, we had the formal... Um, meetings annually and all sorts of meetings in between. It's resulted in a number of books. Um, you could put it up on your website, uh, Beyond Physicalism, uh, Ed and Emily Kelly. And uh, 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 there, 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 there's, it's, uh, it's produced a lot of ripples. Uh, there's a lot of this at the University of Virginia uh, mm -hmm. with archives of uh, the two big archives. One is these near-death phenomena. Now, um, when the William James was alive in the Society of Psychical Research, we did not have the resuscitation abilities we have now, nor did we have these eight-hour surgeries on the brain or the heart where people are flatlined on all the tests, the brain waves and heart, and then they then they revived, and they then described floating around in a subtle body and describing, I mean, there's quite a literature. I mean, uh, the, the Journal of Near-Death Studies has been going for 40 years, and um, that's a lot of evidence. And the people involved in that, Bruce Grayson, the longtime editor, was coming to us at every year. But then the big archive of Ian Stevenson, memories of children, particularly, um, particularly uh, two to five, who want to talk about a past life. And they have 2,600 case studies there in Virginia. So, okay. So this is empirically based research, the same mandate. Yeah. So death is in play, seriously, and survival. 
there's a huge body of experience that you have to contend with and challenges a hardline physicalism. It's how come people can do this? What's going on? And then you have the, the literature of, <clears throat> from Buddhism and so forth of Tibetan Buddhism about dying. And you have hospices, well, in Europe and America, <clears throat> where, um, you know, hard, heavy hitting physicalist scientists themselves are with their family members, you know, doing Buddhist crossovers. So, you know, these are performative contradictions. You know, you're advocating um, your atheism and your, that when you, there is no life after death. Meanwhile, you're acting as if you think yes. 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 Now, of course, that's an ancient, with the birth of modernity, I mean, Voltaire. You know, Voltaire was more religious than anybody gives him credit for. <laughs> but he, he just didn't believe in the church anymore. And, um, Etc. But um, so from the birth of the modernity and um, science, you had this other side running alongside. Anyway, well, I I have to stop it here and and give you some time with our audience. Uh, but it's fascinating. Thank you, Michael. I'll hand well, it up, over to the other Michael, and we'll continue. Uh, this is great. Thank you so much, Alex and Michael. And now we're going to move to the next session of our program, which is question and answers. Uh, if you have a question for Michael um, or Alex, please use the raise your hand function to call attention to yourself. And please, uh, as we are limited on time, please keep your questions tight, succinct, and ideally one question per person. And with that, I'd like to bring Todd, Todd Bureau into the mix. If you can unmute yourself, I'll add spotlight. And okay, well, before the question, Michael, um, first deep gratitude for what you've given to humanity and the gift that Esalen is to humanity. Having had the deep privilege of being there, one does feel it's a portal that uh, you're sort of dancing in the divine nature of human in, um, inquisitiveness and profundity. So I thank you for that. And I thank you also for your chapter in Beyond Physicalism that gave me a philosophical home when you articulated um, evolutionary panentheism. And one of the greatest um, observations from Mr. Kripal when he was in Pari this last year, which is he, he felt a great kinship with the spirit there with Esalen. And I took that as, as in a magnificent compliment for the efforts that go on with Pari. But my question to you is, I know that Roger Nelson of, of the Global Consciousness Project spent much time at Esalen in the early days and that the Global Conscious Project was sort of an outgrowth of his inquiries in his previous work. But how do you feel that the Global Conscious Project in its form then and its newer form now uh, with wider data sets, et cetera, how will that sort of penetrate a wider public to maybe open these questions up that there is something beyond the physical? Just your thoughts on that, please. Well, Todd, I oh, I've, thank you for the uh, for your warm statements. I, I I don't know about them. I haven't kept track, so I'm unqualified uh, to speak. Uh, seriously, um, you know things get uh, hatched, and it's, it's impossible for me to keep track of it all. It's um it's been de very generative, so uh, I'm sorry. I I I simply don't know enough to, to respond. <laughs> you but gave it the gem that Ereslin did, so I think it's doing wonderful things, but thank you for that. Yeah, well, well, okay. Well, you've, uh, you've, uh, you've pushed a button now. I'll keep alert here. If anybody's listening, they can send me some stuff. Good, I'm, I'm wide open. Great. Thanks so much, Todd, and thank you so much, Michael. Uh, if we could move on to Chris, I'll spotlight you, and if you could unmute yourself. Uh... Um, hi, Michael, Alex, many thanks. Um, I've been a fan since the 80s, Michael, so it's very exciting to hear you speak, um, and you've lived up to what I thought you might do, so that's impressive. <laughs> um, I was thinking about popular culture, and... Um, like these massive films like The Creator and Avatar and Star Wars or whatever, these get made and billions of pounds are spent on them or millions. 
and so it feels like money can be found sometimes to put these ideas yeah. big big time into the world Esalen's wonderful but how do we get it out there and right I wonder what you feel about that way of going and maybe something around that in a for yourself if that makes well, sense well all, thank you uh, all i can say is amen i mean it uh the movie um okay it was invented in the 20, 20th century it has grown into a stupendous instrument um and it's frightfully underused and is <clears throat> got a dreadful shortage of, of folks who um well who would resonate with all of us who gathered here today um so all i can say is amen we um uh, have um we have been home to um some movie makers um who have come down to Esalen to get leads for uh certain movies that have tried to move into these territories but it's uh, it's 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 waiting to happen it's waiting to happen and um i you know so certain people venture in like uh, kubrick's 2001 you know uh, as a giant um metaphysical um um call um uh to our intuition uh that's magnificent it shows what you can do um i got very interested in how he came to make that movie and um you know he stopped at different periods it was a long gestation and difficult and he um what you need now to pull the, the uh tremendous wherewithal they have together is a formidable um dramatist a shakespeare the uh, 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 uh let's say our greater self um who can command the millions and well hundreds of millions of dollars uh to do full justice to this now there's some people hoping to and um a member of our board of trustees who comes from a um well an extremely wealthy uh family um has had a dream of creating an Esalen movie studio and go after this all I can say we've had dreamers around the edge but we we haven't done it you're absolutely right in this where there is no vision the people will perish and right now the world is in a very bad turn when we look at Russia and Hamas and Trump I mean when we look at all this and where there is no vision the people will perish and movies could do something fantastic so I totally agree with you we are that's all I can say is amen and there are a few of us you know who um are trying to do something but um I got involved in actually making a movie of that first book I wrote golf in the kingdom now it was a little teeny independent thing and um I had um um to give you an idea of how tricky this is um for some of us um I started selling options on that book to movies before it was published people got word of what I was doing so I started year after year for 40 years or more selling options for a year and and nobody could figure out and finally we got around to Clint Eastwood and you would think he had the wherewithal and he, so we I succumbed and sold it the movie rights to that book off in the kingdom which has been translated into nine languages it's crazy that uh, how successful that book has been but it's opened many doors to me into the sport world so it gives a lot of opportunities anyway he worked on it for 10 years I got tell you he said I it's I can't do it it's beyond our reach me and my gang and I honor him 
uh, he plays within his game, you know, and um, he and he's 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 a good craftsman. I mean, he's made some good movies, um, but um, so these two gals um, picked it up, and I got involved, and soon. I was assigned to the perimeter of the movie and told to stay out of things. And of course, this is the fate of writers in Hollywood because, you know, it's like a military campaign with maybe 30 people on point in a big shoot, you know, and if you've got a lot happening and you need a, you at the very least, you need a powerful director. And um, anyway, um, they thought my uh, interventions uh, had to be dealt with and it kicked me off the set continuously. I was kicked off, even though it was the book I'd written. And uh, so, but I understand them because um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complex uh, art form involving a lot of disparate talents. I mean, the temperament, say, of a cinematographer compared to a film editor compared to an actor, uh, these are, it's like, you know, these are species differences. It's like, you know, yes, we all look like we're humans, but you get <laughs> a speciation event on a movie set. I mean, you got, this one says, now look, you're not doing this. And pretty soon this passion, these conflicting passions of gifted craftspeople it uh, reenacts the problems we've had at Esalen, but um, on a limited budget, and you can't just horse around. And it's like you're you're spending a lot of money, so it's a difficult birth. Uh, the big this our big vision that we're talking about here, and uh, undertaking and exploration with movies. But uh, amen. Someday someone's going to rise up who who has the commanding power. Somebody like an Orson Welles or Stanley Kubrick, um, um, who could pull this stuff together and do it. I mean, there've been some great European uh, uh, directors and some Russian ones, but they have not had the ways and means and the money that. Oh God! One thing about Hollywood, they know how to raise a lot of money. It's um. Anyway. <laughs> thank you, Michael, and thank you, Chris, for your question. We're going to move through the queue a little bit. And Olga, if you would unmute yourself. Uh, yes, thank you. Up. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Michael, Alex, and uh, uh, it's amazing for me to find out about the existence of your organization. Um, I am. Um, I um, uh, started uh, my journey into the field of uh, bioenergy, subtle energy, in that kind of organization in uh, laboratory in Russia, as a medical oh. doctor, uh, founded by the USSR <laughs> Minister of Space. Uh, specifically studying um, a research around um, bioenergy, where and how to use it. So after two years, of, uh, we immigrated to Canada, and then I became, as <laughs> Alex said, lone wolf, <laughs> uh, doing a completely independent wow. research uh, on subtle energy, because it's an um, um, absolute necessity for us uh, to become aware of this world of subtle energy, because we all have dual nature uh, yeah. of a particle and a wave, and we all function under two sets of laws of nature. Uh, one for explicate order, where we born and die, and another one for implicate order, um, that vibrational world that functions under completely different uh, laws um, of nature, completely. Uh, we, we have no idea, unless we start to deal with it, how it functions. Yeah. And uh, our mind belong, uh, belongs to vibrational world. So it's, a, it's not just aura. <laughs> well, as a blueprint of everything, what what is what is existing, subject object of uh, our interest, but um, our mind 
uh, belong to this um, uh, field. So um, um, now it's a little bit better situation before I wouldn't be able to talk even about it. But, but still it is a uh, uh, huge um, uh, uh, wide spot um, yeah. in people's yeah. life. So thank you oh. so much that you um, you are doing you are so much involved in that. And well, yeah, um, Olga, you inspire a thought. Uh, Alex, you know what we could do at Pari is have a group of um, Russians, Americans, Europeans together on this subject. Uh, it's been um, uh, here now. Okay, um, now we're brainstorming. But uh, Putin himself is into this stuff. But he's turned into an authoritarian monster. And it's a bad habit. You know, Olga, I love Russia. I am a... a, a I, 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 I've always been in love with Russia. I, uh, And this, uh, our gang, my wife, has an institute dedicated to this called Track 2 citizen diplomacy and the main focus is russia and you can imagine our pain now with our friends because you know there are tens of thousands of russians living in europe and america now who uh it's like it was before uh world war one uh and you know there are a lot of people and some of them were sitting there in geneva and planning a new russia all right these people these Russians, these friends of ours, are thinking about this. What's going to happen after Putin? All right, that's their hope. We could have some meetings on these subjects where we do have common ground. Mm -hmm. You know, this hidden human reserves, Russian interest. I just, we put that into play, Alex. You know, party would be, oh, that'd be a good place to do this. Kind of neutral ground. It sounds fantastic. Anyway, but yes, I'm, 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 I'm on, uh, but, but uh, Russia is my past life. I am 35 years out of that country. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not um, familiar with really what's going yeah. on there. But no, not, least... not, yeah, but you know, Olga, I'm just saying this is a possibility. I mean, it's, um, oh boy, it's, I, I wrote a novel about this called An End to Ordinary History, if anybody's interested. Uh, it, it, it was very idealistic. It was published in 1983, um, uh, where the my central character was a KGB guy who was a Sufi. And his <laughs> secret Could be. Could be. his secret aim was to join the ideals of the highest form of socialism with this, um, the kinds of things we're talking about now. Um, so I, uh, I and others have had this dream. It would be a common ground between Russia and America, certainly. I mean, because there's these two nuclear powers that always seeming to stand off against each other, but necessarily involves Europeans. I mean, it's or the whole world the, yeah, whole the future world. the fu the future human will be a, will be human unit unity will be required i mean absolutely we, we should not cease to seek you, you know that. you use pari there alex as a kind of leverage point you've got there hmm. i'm is, still waiting to see pictures of the place anyway yeah thank you olga and thank you michael and this is great and going uh, always into the brainstorming realm and <laughs> new ideas bubbling up from kind of out of the ether, so to speak. Uh, I know we went a little long in the conversation. Do we have time? We have a few more people with raised hands. Uh, we're at the 26. Do we have time for like one more question, perhaps, Alex and Michael? Would that work? That depends on Michael. It's fine with me. Uh... Okay. Oh, Let's go ahead. Laura, Laura, would you like to jump in and I'll spotlight you for your question? Yes, hi. Um, so Michael, I have been uh, 
I've had anomalous experiences since I was a child. Um, I've come from a family who has long history of that. Um, I kind of ignored it until about a year ago and just sort of like brushed it off. And I have spent the past year really exploring these ideas, studying these ideas. Um, I've, um, and I want to continue doing this in a more organized um, academic fashion. And I have gotten, <laughs> I've asked scholars and academics that I respect um, the question, you know, how should I move forward in this? So I, I spoke with Diana walsh Basalka, I spoke with Peter Skafish and, um, and some others and, and all say that um, academia is moving too slow on these ideas and that is not the place to, um, to get involved. Um, but they also say that um, the only <laughs> the only field that you're gonna move forward, because I've been interested in parapsychology since I was a child. Um, and I'm in Atlanta and um, very interested in the um, program at University of West Georgia in transpersonal studies and they have a parapsychology wow. program. So um, uh, they've also said, if you're gonna do it parapsychology, don't do that. You need to do it through religious studies, which is something you sort of hit on but that's not really where my interest lies. So I feel like I'm getting mixed <laughs> mixed uh, yeah. signals to where I should go. Not that I need you to solve my, you know, my life's problems, but I'd love to know what your thoughts are. And someone who is in a position to make a life, big life decision right now and has the freedom to do that and really would like to move forward in studying these experiences and ideas. Oh boy, well, um... And your name again is? Uh, My name is Laura, Laura Faibois. Well, Laura, well, listen, that's a huge question. I mean, I have to be uh, uh, careful with such a big question. I, um, uh, being um, uh, where you are in life's journey, <clears throat> um, the first thing I have to say, there's nothing more uh, wide open to have a great life is in this. All right. Then how do you start? Um, uh, and you, okay, parapsychology as a field is almost dead. The American Society of Psychic Research, the, I think they still have one walk up uh, office somewhere in the bowels of Manhattan. I mean, with one, like, I mean, it's these organizations that were carrying it in the old days. Are, it's amazing how mainstream academia has smothered mm -hmm. these uh, young uh, things. In uh, okay, so okay, we go to religious studies now. I, I would have said yes it, within the field of religious studies. They have the mandates, but you have to deal with the academic re requirements. I mean. So if you're serious about, a, you know, that's a long haul. To, it's like being a doctor or a lawyer. I mean, you have to go to graduate school. You have to learn that language. Um, sure. Boy, um, we'd have to have a longer conversation. I, um, I did, I'd have to know more about your background and so forth. But there are a lot of avenues forward. I mean, for example, I have willy-nilly been summoned by uh, coaches and athletes now i you know seriously right into the nfl if you've ever you know, watched the football games it's different on tv than down on the field i mean it's for those uninitiated you get down on the field of an nfl game and you see these guys you know 245 pounds that can run a hundred meter dash and under hundred sec, and then you get to Isaac Newton. F equals m a. You know the momentum. You don't want to be tackled by one of these people. And I've had buddies who've actually run out, crazy guys. You know, uh, too many beers, and run out during the game and get just clipped and carted off the field. It's sad to see it. It's like a species difference. I mean, you can't get out there with the athletes. But I'm summoned, and all right. Now, there is a an emerging field. I'm using this as an example of what's going on. An emerging field of, um, it would be like um, counselors now are permitted, certainly in California, 
without an MD uh, and without uh, the certification of a PhD to give psychological counseling. Now this is happening in sport <clears throat> to people who might have a training in, well, physiology, but not specifically, guided. and slowly but surely, there's a kind of a new uh, field emerging of um, people who have to help out with, say, these concussions in an NFL football game. But throughout the sport world, there are kind of athlete whisperers, you know, like they're horse whisperers, athlete mm -hmm. whisperers talking about these states. But again, mm -hmm. I mean, this is uh, on my part on the edge of irresponsibility uh, telling you to, to go search. But, that, but uh, my point is, there are ways, uh, people are finding ways to create work for themselves and make money for themselves working in these fields. Now, if you wanted to be a researcher, um, boy. I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in altered states of consciousness and studying that. So it just feels like the people, I expect it's, it's like they're telling me to go one way and it's maybe it is I just need to sort of forge a field of my own and, and that's the answer. Are you teaching at, at West Georgia? No, no, but I was um, interested in their program there. Their transpersonal so they, they, they were one of the places, you know, little known to the world, West Georgia. But they had a center around the trans, a Maslow and uh, those early uh, Esalen days in the 60s. Uh, mm -hmm. And they were early into what became transpersonal psychology. So yeah. they do, there is some basis there. And there are colleges like University of California in Santa Barbara, nice mm -hmm. place to live. Um, the, um, and there are certain um, uh, other schools um, that have some sort of um, informal ways and means of getting into these subjects. But it's yeah. sketchy. It's sketchy. I mean, to make a life in this, um, uh, in theater, um, believe it or not, um, we had a lot of um, connections in our earlier years with what, what turned out to be, you know, Saturday Night Live and... Uh -huh. and well, okay, it's it's related to Second City, which mm -hmm. is a school of improvisation in Chicago. Well, the founder's mother was leading programs at Esalen, Viola Spolin. She's very famous at theater games. And because Fritz Perls, who invented gestalt therapy, wanted to be a theater person. So, and we have psychodrama. And so theater has always been in flirtation with Esalen. Partly it's that, you know, Hollywood is nearby and a lot of actors and actresses come to Esalen. And because we prize anonymity, we don't put their pictures up on the wall. So that, you know, it, it's tough to be a celebrity and get into this stuff. But some of them show up at Esalen and some of them are producers and movie makers, et cetera. And I can tell you that within that larger community and even at Juilliard, which is, you know, for, for the arts, and we have performed music and acting it is an elite place for that, for the arts. And um, Robin Williams was there. I mean, many, many well-known comedians and, um, oh God, it goes on and on and on. All right. Within that field, there are a lot of um, natural ways forward. Um, so these theater games, uh, for example, you're taught at Juilliard, uh, they, they use children's games a lot there, you know, that, that's what they amount to. And um, people think of it as where you go to learn the violin from Isaac Stern and you learn to conduct from Leonard Bernstein. Well, it's also where you learn to be, open up your larger self. And, and willy-nilly, here you're gonna have mystical experiences. You're gonna have telepathic events. And I, I tell you this, I mean, you even have stigmata, kundalini. I mean, see, this stuff goes on, but the people doing it are not prepared for it, and it scares them often. And, um, uh, and you know, if, if you see, well, anyway, um, if you've ever been around a truly multiple personality, it's frightening. It's frightening. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, we get it uh, once in a while. Somebody comes to us, I go, where they flip right in front of you. And um, well, you know, there's a, a lore in the world of theater that certain actors are so good at this that they regularly scare other people in their production. I've heard this a number of times about, for example, Meryl Streep, you know, the famous actress. Oh. It, it, an actress. Well, she's had 20 nominations. And what has frightened people is that when she morphs, um, you know, in a true multiple, you know, the eyeball changes, the face changes, it's scary. Because, you know, we're used to being around people we're used to, but suddenly, let's say you're living with someone and you come in and they've morphed into another person. You, I mean, and the way they talk and the way they are, it's scary. If I may jump in here, just to mention something to, to Laura as well, and briefly, because we're running out of time, but we can continue as long as necessary. I, I, I've i come out of the closet. I have a near-death experience two and a half years ago. Uh, I thought there was nothing. And there's a, there's a lot of research going on. And yes, perhaps psychology is perhaps kind of dead, but it's not because I've, I've discovered many, probably not, maybe not many, but quite a few really solid researchers that are doing that. And it depends what name we want to give it. Perhaps psychology may, perhaps sounds like an insult, um, <clears throat> but you can call it consciousness research um, yeah. or, you know, and, and there's a lot right. going on. And part of what I'm trying to do as a person, but also within the Paris Center is also create a space like Esalen where we can be open-minded about these things and rigorous at the same time and connect right. people. And, and, and there's kind of this underground network you scratch a little bit and then you see you're surprised like it's is it everywhere it's it's incredible like and you talk to people and the more you talk to people the more they talk back at you and they confess that yes this has also happened to me so i, I would continue this conversation with you and michael specifically about how to do that because i'm trying to i'm struggling to do it at a personal level and i'm struggling to do it as a, as an organizational level and and this is why we're having this conversation so it totally fits I appreciate your work so much because, yeah, I, I just feel like I keep trying to fit my interest into like a square peg into a round hole in that, I guess, consciousness, it's, it seems like this topic needs a rebranding very badly. Um, and that's, it's almost like a marketing issue because academics are too afraid of the woo, um, but this is what needs to be studied. And, but then you talk to them in person and then, you know, they have these experiences and they've actually done lots of research on this. Um, they're just calling it, it's under the guise of another name. And so I appreciate both of y'all's work. And yeah, I just wish there was a Esalen or a Pari more available to more people. And, I, and, uh, well, it's, it's also virtual these days. It's, it's non-local yeah, in a very tangible way. And, but it's good oh. to have places to call, like kind of a home to, to kind of gather in a shelter. And that's why Esalen has been so influential. Exactly. Well, exactly. Well, Laura, you. you keep looking and you will discover people. Uh, they'll start popping out of the damnedest places. Yes. It's, it's, all of this is hiding in plain sight. I mean, yes. it's, it's amazing. Yeah. It, and that's started to happen. It's just, I guess I'm still... Um, I mean, I know why there's so much stigma and fear attached to this topic. And um, so people are, are hesitant to talk about it. But yeah, it's. Uh, and let me stress this. Let, let me stress, we, we need you and, and, and you need us in the sense we, we need the experiences and the experts to talk to one another and blend. And, and when an experience happens to an expert or when, when an experiencer becomes expert in that experience, this, this is what needs to be remarried again. And, and so don't. I mean, it's great we can talk about these things because then we realize we're all in the same boat. This is, yeah. happens to everyone. One way or another, this happens to everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's a shame that, you know, I'm only finding out about family experiences now and I'm almost 41. So it's like there's the, this shame that's been put around it, yet we've all been experiencing it. So um, anyways, I think things are starting to change and I credit both of you all, Michael, very much so um, for your work. So thank you. Well, keep going. Thanks. Thanks so much, Laura. Laura. And yeah, um, this is where the rubber hits the road, right? Like this is where we start trying to apply it. 
<clears throat> and I would say pay attention to those coffee shop conversations or the curious people you run into. I yeah. run into some really, just like what Michael was saying earlier about trading secrets in these hidden networks. If you're open to it, you know, sometimes that person's right beside you in a coffee shop and you, you never know, you never know who you're going to run into and what their interests are. Yeah. So with that, Alex, Michael, are there any, um, any final words? I have a few announcements, but is any, any wrap up or anything that you guys want to well, do? I have two big words, two big words, which is thank you. Thank you. And same, same with me, Michael. I, thank you very much. I mean, this is a ton of fun and uh, to be continued. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you both so much. This, this is great. And thank you all for your questions, because this is really where everything comes together. Um, <clears throat> it's the last, um, this is the last future human of uh, 2023. So with that, I do have a few announcements to make. In 2024, Alex will continue to curate and host a new series of conversations to address the future mind. And this will be seeking to glean, gain clarity and insight into important contemporary matters that require both urgent action as well as deep reflection. The first installment in this series will be on Wednesday, January 31st with Robert Lawrence Kuhn. We wish all of you a safe and peaceful holiday season and look forward to seeing you in the new year here at the Pari Center and online. Thank you all so very, very much. And this is one of Alex's favorite parts where we all kind of wave and fade out. Zoom out. It's the zoom out. Thank yeah. you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> and thank you, everybody, for being here today. Bye-bye.